Uh, Justin, can you hear us? I can. Can you hear me? Yeah. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? Uh, I'm doing great. Good morning, guys. Thanks for having me. It's so great to have you here. You know, I'm going to I'm going to let Dale take over here in just one second. But I got to ask you this question since you 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 are, you know, you're obviously you're like the you're like the 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 how should I say this? Uh, like I said, you're the concierge of brokers. You help individual traders find a brokerage firm that's best suited for their needs. And the one, the, the, the one thing that I, I tell our guys and our traders every day is we love partnering with you guys for the last several years because you, you really hold traders' hands and really help them find a broker that's best suited for, for them. But the, the question I wanted to ask you, because we were having this talk about risk today, you probably are keenly aware of traders and probably have seen a lot of traders over the years that have taken on way too much risk as new traders. And um, what, what's been your experience with new new traders in you know the industry as, as you've seen it? You know, is, is, is there a lot of, how should we say, blowing up? going on? <laughs> uh, it's a great question. And um, to your point, you know, what we see from a lot of newer traders coming in is, is two things and, and they're volatile when mixed together. One is mismanaged expectations about how easy this is going to be and how much money they're going to make in the early days. The other is a true lack of discipline or risk management to the way that they approach their they're trading. Um, and you, you do see a lot of people take some very expensive lessons in the early days of their live trading. Um, yeah. And, you know, you're the, the perfect case in point, uh, Blake, in that, you know, you, you sort of grew up in this industry. You, you, you learned it, you know, in many ways, the right way. You took your lumps when you had to. Um, but it, it's a profession like anything else, right? I started my career as a lawyer. I went to law school. I practiced as an attorney. Uh, it took years of my life to get to a point where I was even marginally competent to actually represent the client, for example. Um, this is no different. This is a profession like being a doctor or lawyer or you know anything else. It takes time. It takes experience. It takes discipline above all else, in my view. Um, and there's really no. I mean, you can't read a book, Justin. Uh, how I made a, turn ten thousand dollars into a million by Larry you, Williams. You and can you're, you're open just... an account and and be able to do it. Uh, it, it in my experience, no. Uh, maybe yeah, there are a couple of sure. savants out there that can make that happen. Yeah. Um, but there's no there's no substitute for for experience. There's no substitute for. Uh, signing in and signing out every day and developing a routine that's tried and true, uh, that's grounded in solid, repeatable principles. Uh, and um, that's, that's really the, the, the first thing that we see from newer traders at where they, they kind of get into some trouble. Um, the other thing, uh, to, to your point, guys, you talk about you know, traders taking big losses is, um, is traders, especially newer traders, become married to a trade, right? You start out as a trader, the trade doesn't go your way, and then you become what I call an investor, where you're yeah. not going to get out of that trade no matter what happens. You're going to wait until it gets back to break even because your ego simply won't allow you to take a loss. Mm -hmm. The way I look at trading, and, and, and maybe it's the same for you guys, is you have a thesis when you get into a trade, right? Certain stars align in a certain way, and you go, I want to be long the euro here. But when that thesis breaks down, it's time to get out of that trade because at that point, you're not trading anymore. You're just hoping and hoping isn't a strategy in my view. Right. Uh, but a lot of newer traders have tremendous difficulty in just taking a loss. Um, and I wrote an article a couple of uh, years ago called Cut Your Damn Losses, where we actually did um, a, a data mining of our traders to show that of all the open trades that traders were carrying, um, longer than a week, um, the percentage of them that were down and the magnitude of those trades that were um, in the negative relative to the ones that were positive. It was overwhelmingly stacked with traders holding on to losing positions, letting them get worse and worse over time, letting the swap fees accrue just because they couldn't get off of a losing position when the thesis broke down. Um, so That's, those are some it, of the bigger issues we see. 
And, you know, Justin, that's a, that, so I, guys, I can't express to you how important what Justin is, uh, the inf- information that Justin's given you. One of the, one of the uh, benefits of, of Justin's point of view is that he sees it from above, kind of like God's view, if you will, looking down on everybody. Uh, and, and I'm saying that in a good way, you get to see everything. And um, from that point of view, it's like seeing a bird's eye view of everything that's going on. You will have your anomalies and I'm sure you have, you know, you will have your people like, look, I was an anomaly. I, I, I'll be the first one to admit it. When I was 26 years old, for me to make three quarter of a million dollars literally in one day because I was long go to net G N E T um, on a stock that happened to gap up from uh, $5 to $80. And I had like a 20 some thousand share position for that to happen to somebody uh, uh, is pure luck. And so I was an anomaly, which fortunately kickstarted my career. And then, you know, I went, but those are rare. And it doesn't happen often. (laughs) So, right. I mean, if you're looking at the norm and the average and probably the majority, the 98 percentile of everybody else, they fall into these categories that Justin's talking about. So it's important that you you take heed. Uh, Justin, I have a question uh, regarding crypto. And, uh, you know, we had that situation during the crash where, People couldn't get out of positions. They couldn't get money. Uh, 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 Coinbase uh, is not a regulated exchange. Uh, I don't believe there are any crypto exchanges regulated. Yet there are some, aren't there some regulated firms that uh, let you trade crypto as a CFD? And what would be the difference between um, these exchanges that are unregulated and trading with a regulated uh, broker that offers CFDs? Uh, well, com- complicated question, and I, I don't want to um, point out uh, a mistake, but uh, you know, firms oh, like Coinbase, they are, they are regulated exchanges. Um, so Coinbase by in who? particular. Um, by the CFTC. So Coinbase oh, is, uh, is okay. what's called a a money service business and they've obtained money transmitter licenses in the various states in which they operate, which at this I point see. in time is what one needs to be at least stateside to be a regulated crypto exchange. Unlike um, an FCM, inclination. unlike an FCM or. Um, Correct. What, okay. what basically what you have with, with crypto exchanges at this moment in time is um, you have trouble sort of putting them in a particular box. So, we don't really know, are they just, you know, the movement of money or is it something more akin to like a, an FCM or an RFED, which would be a futures or a Forex broker that would be regulated where um, it's federalized. So right now, crypto exchanges, they go through a very basic federal registration as a money service business, but then you actually have to obtain licensing in every state in which you transact business, which is very different than futures and Forex brokers where you just obtain your licensing at the federal level and then you're authorized to act in every state. Uh, so we'll likely see uh, some pretty sweeping regulatory changes in the, the coming years with regard to crypto. Uh, okay. but, but Coinbase is, is, a, is, a, is regulated in the way that they're supposed to be regulated at this time. Okay. Um, with regard to, um, to crypto CFD trading, however, um, so you have regulated brokers outside of the U.S. that are licensed and, and authorized to offer CFD products, contracts for difference. And basically, these are off-exchange derivatives of an on-exchange product like Bitcoin, for example, or oil or gold. Um, and um, the, the benefit of trading these types of products with a regulated broker uh, as a CFD is really twofold. One is you get the benefit of what's called cross margining, where you have all of these products that you can trade from one single account, right? So if you wanted to trade the underlying assets in the States, for example, um, if you wanted to trade FX futures, stocks, options, and crypto, you would have to do that where each one is in their own separate trading account and very often with a separate broker. Uh, Whereas when you trade the CFD products, you can trade all of those with one broker in the same account. That's the first benefit. 
Um, the other is you can typically trade with more leverage than what's afforded you on exchange. Uh, so a lot of these um, regulated brokers that are offering crypto CFDs will offer you anywhere from you know two to 10 times leverage. Um, so for yeah. those who really want to intraday trade, um, there's, a, there's a great opportunity to take advantage of that and the, the additional buying power they give you. And you, you know what I found, Justin, is, um, you know, because in my in my uh, search of, of trading cryptos over the last few months, uh, I, I didn't realize that a lot of these F, a lot of these Forex brokers, you it really only buy only you can only go long. And there's there's very few brokers right now, especially in the U, being U.S. based. There's very few brokers that offer like a leveraged product uh, where you can trade on margin and be short crypto. Uh, well, we're seeing we're seeing a bit of a liquidity crunch. So the, the brokers themselves have to figure out where are they getting their liquidity from. Yeah. And similar to offering um, like single share equity CFDs, um, you know, if you want to go short Apple, you can typically go short Apple, but you actually need to obtain a borrow from right. either your broker or or someone that they're connected with um, because you just can't go outright short. You have to essentially be borrowing that stock from someone who holds it and then essentially trading the difference on the way down. Um, so brokers are, are challenged with the same things right now in crypto, where they have to find uh, relationships that will allow them to facilitate both long and short trading for underlying clients who don't actually hold the, the asset. And, uh, and, and, there, and I'm, I'm sure that that's going to be more broad based as as time goes along, of course. Um, now, oh, Justin, Justin uh, I, I oh, go ahead, Blake. Uh, oh, oh, I was just going to say, I'll, I'll let you answer, uh, ask this question, Dale. But I, I, I know yes, Justin, John. you had a presentation that you wanted to That's show what everybody. I was ask. <laughs> oh, and what's that? Dale? That's what I was going to ask. Him. Oh, okay. Go ahead. I, I, <laughs> yeah, go, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> No, that's all right. So uh, you you prepared something for us to see, Justin. Uh, if you want to share the screen and, and yeah, it's us, just what? a um, it's just a short presentation. Something I mentioned uh, to Blake yesterday. Um, it, it's a presentation that I think could be useful to both new and uh, and some veteran traders as well um, about I think the so states too. that I, we I, see. I just uh, you should you should be able to take the screen now as presenter, Justin. Okay, yeah. Let me. Uh, I had to stop sharing share my screen and hopefully it will uh, allow me to do this properly. I'm going to expand uh, to presentation mode. Are you guys seeing my yep. PowerPoint? Oh, no, we see Amazon. Um, oh, what are you buying there? Just is kidding. That, Joking. Is that my, my browser history? I, that was, <laughs> I was told that wouldn't show up. Uh, <laughs> no, we can see your presentation. Go ahead. All right. Very good. So, um, so for, for everyone that that's tuning in, this is a presentation that, uh, I put together some months back and um, it's basically a compilation of the mistakes that we see newer traders make when choosing a broker. Um, you know, unlike um, on exchange products, uh, you know, stocks and futures, for example, where everyone is trading the same product at the same price because it's part of a national market system. Uh, the choices of, you know, choosing one broker relative to another really differ only in the form of maybe the platform they offer, the service they provide, and the commission they charge. But the underlying product you're trading is the same no matter what broker you use. In, in FX, and when you're talking CFDs in particular as well, um, it's very, very different. We're talking about an over-the-counter market where we don't have a centralized repository where all the products are, are trading and clearing. We have an interbank market where each broker is aggregating pricing from various different liquidity providers, and they're offering you certain pricing models, certain execution models, platforms, and all other, all, all various other factors that um, can make you make a good choice of broker or a bad choice of broker. And um, it's really important to just understand how to find the right broker for what you're looking to do. And uh, this presentation is essentially the exact opposite. Of, it's what are the mistakes that people are making um, when choosing a broker, and ultimately, how can you avoid them? Uh, so I'll go through uh, Blake and Dale. Um, if you have any questions yourselves, if you uh, receive any questions from people who are listening in, stop me. I'm happy to go off on a tangent and answer to them mid-presentation. I'm very informal and very comfortable with the topic. So I just want to make sure that at the end of the day, we confer 
uh, value and everyone can take something away that hopefully they can and, use and put into practice. And appreciate that too. So guys, um, in the chat box, uh, as, as we're moving along, if you, if you have a question about what Justin's covering, make sure you write it there, Dale, Dale, or myself, or, or one of us will be, you know, just reading the comments. So any, any, any comments that you guys might have, we, you know, we can, we can, we can try to interrupt Justin as he's going, as he's moving along. All right. Thanks. I'll let Thanks. you go. <laughs> no, sounds good. So, uh, you know, here's the sort of industry standard risk disclaimer. And um, obviously we, we've spent quite a bit of time just since I joined the call um, talking about risk and risk management. Um, but from our standpoint, uh, and I'll talk about, you know, who and what Forest Park is, our, our job and, and, and where we see a great deal of our value offering to clients is helping to de-risk the brokerage selection process as best we can. So who are we? Uh, Forest Park is a company that I started over eight years ago. Uh, we are a regulated introducing broker. Uh, we're regulated here in the US with the NFA. We're also regulated in the UK uh, with the FCA and passported throughout Europe. And uh, I started this company with a particular mission in mind, which was to help traders navigate the minefield of finding suitable brokers. Uh, this was at a time when there were many, many more brokers. Uh, it was much more the Wild West. And um, you could really get yourself in trouble if you made the wrong decision. And there were a lot of introducing brokers out there at the time that were mere pass-through organizations or even firms that would actually mark up your cost of trading without really providing any value. And I just felt that there weren't any client-facing um, companies out there that were really advocating to protect the client. And so we felt that we could create a little niche for ourselves and, and put some goodwill out into the world. Um, and that's, uh, that was really our, our mission behind the start of the company. And uh, the way that we, we operate is we really try to get to know our clients. We want to understand what their objectives are, what their needs are. We want to understand their strategy. Uh, we want to take into account all the factors that go into a broker's decision like products traded, number of trades per day, average size of trade, time of day, uh, length of holding the trade, preferred platform, uh, any third-party tools or technology that they're using, all sorts of things that, um, you know, when you mix it all together, can say, you know, broker A is better than broker B, and I can articulate to you why. Um, and our services really break down into uh, the four key boxes that you see on the right. Um, the first one, which I'll talk about in more depth later on, is we offer cashback rebates to all of our clients. Uh, so if you open an account through our introduction with one of the regulated and top brokers that we work with, uh, we actually make it cheaper for you to trade with that broker than if you open that account directly. Um, it's pure value add. There's no strings, there's no markups. Um, it's just literally a lower cost of trading for you. Um, but we start the relationship with our broker consultation, and that is where we take into account all of those various factors. And um, we want to understand what you're looking for and looking to accomplish. And from there, we'll be able to point you in a direction of one or two or three brokers that might be the most suitable for what you're looking to accomplish. Um, we do have a, a very, very talented um, coding and programming services team as well. So if you have an interest in developing your own custom indicators or algorithms, uh, we can help you to uh, basically take what's in your head and put it into um, programmatic uh, logic. Um, for me, that's, be that's been very useful over the years because I can think of some things, but I have zero coding ability whatsoever. So um, I actually started this uh, side of our business out of my own need, and then we started to offer it to traders. Um, and uh, last but really not least is ongoing service and support. You know, there are um, many ways to become frustrated and disenchanted with the trading world these days, right? It's, it's no longer, Blake, you know, being in a gigantic trading room with 100 traders with you and you're talking shop every day at the water cooler. Everyone is, you know, basically isolated, even before, you know, COVID times, you know, right? You go into your home office, you boot up your laptop or your desktop, and you're trading. And at best, you're part of a virtual community like this. Right. Totally. That's, and that's been that's been like one of the you know benefits of Forex Analytics is our community. I mean, especially through COVID. Right. I mean, this is, this for most traders is it as good as you will ever find anywhere in the world right now because the industry has changed and um, this you know this type of service allows you to at least connect with people from all over the world looking at the market from different perspectives and lenses, um, but that's not available to everyone. 
And even yeah. if it are, is, are you are you guys going back into the offices, Justin? With your we business, are back or... in, we are back in the office. Yes, we we, Isn't it we great? basically it, it is great to be back. We we, we still yeah. give employees the option at this yeah. point, um, but most have uh, decided to go back into the office, which is great because there is a a collaborative and collegial environment that was missed um, during the pandemic. Not well, I know Trent, Trent wants different. to get away from his baby. I mean, <laughs> Trent, Trent doesn't like working from home under any circumstances. This predates his kid. Um, but, uh, but it's nice to be back in the office, but, but okay. from a service and support standpoint um, in, in all seriousness, um, there are, there are questions that come up. There's questions about your broker, your platform, uh, a trade execution issue, a technology question. It's very hard to get straight answers. Um, we are very client facing and high touch in that regard. So every client of ours, depending on who your account manager is, <clears throat> you'll have that person's email, direct office line and cell phone. Uh, so I joke all the same ways that my wife can yell at me, so can a client. Um, but that's sort of our, our view towards this. Whereas if a client of ours has a problem, we have a problem. So we make ourselves available to provide ongoing service and support and help them work through those issues. And, and sometimes it's as easy as, you know, it's, it's a little, you know, user error, if you will, we can, we can talk them through it, but there are other times they're bigger issues. And instead of having the client, you know, sit on the phone waiting for a customer service rep to come to the line at a broker or talking to some live chat representative in a third world country somewhere else, um, we can escalate those issues right away to the right person and get a faster and, and better resolution. And can I, and I'm going to add here that um, I, I remember just, uh, God, it was maybe a few months ago, maybe, maybe about six months ago, sometime this fall or winter, um, uh, somebody in our chat room in the Forex analytics chat room, um, obviously we have, we've had a working relationship with Forest Park FX for this, but we're probably going on five years now. Um, and, and a great relationship at that. But uh, we had somebody in our chat room that was dealing with maybe IG Bank or one of the European brokers out there, and they were having some serious issues. And I said, I said, hey, have you talked to Forest Park about this? And they're like, no, we, you know, I, we didn't use them to get. I'm like, it doesn't matter. Um, reach out to Forest Park since they're, you know, they're they're, you know, obviously our partners. And um, they'll they'll see what they can do. And I remember one of your one of your representatives really helped them out as far as getting answers. I, I can't remember what exactly what the resolution was, but you had you the the great thing about Forest Park and what you guys do is you have so many you have relationships with pretty much everybody everybody worldwide. So your 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 span and who you can. You, who you can reach out to and who you can who you can get on the on the phone uh, to get somebody some assistance is it's unparalleled. It's really awesome. So well, we I, uh, we try and, and we work yeah. hard to to build and and maintain those relationships. Um, so yeah, I mean we're we're that's that's part of our value proposition is to be the the voice and the advocate for traders so that they're not you know just a tiny voice amongst tens of thousands of clients with a broker, we have, you know, large books of business with most of these brokers and it gives us a, a bit of a megaphone because they're, they may not be so worried about an individual account, but they're worried about our relationship with them. And sure. so we get much more attention and focus when we raise a complaint. Um, and not to say that that happens often, but it's nice to know that you have that, that backing and support should it arise. So jumping back in, um, to the, the six key mistakes that we see here. Um, the first one is, is so obvious and yet it's, it's made by traders every single day, which is working with an unregulated broker. Um, I can't stress how dangerous this is. We have seen this over the years, countless times where um, people either don't know they're working with an unregulated broker or intentionally are seeking one out because they perceive the trading conditions to be so far superior to a regulated broker that they feel they have no choice but to work with such an unregulated firm. And it is a tremendous, tremendous risk to your capital, even if you're not necessarily doing anything wrong. Um, you are essentially working with a firm that's positioned itself as what's you know, quintessentially a bucket shop. Basically, they are actively working against their clients. They look at your deposit as their revenue, and you have 
virtually no oversight from any sort of regulatory body or, or business administration body to hold this broker's feet to the fire to make sure that they have proper governance internally, that they have fair trade execution, that they have sufficient capital to operate their business. You are operating in the flimsiest environment possible. And if something goes wrong, and frankly, when something goes wrong, you have virtually no recourse. These are brokers that are set up in parts of the world that you can't point to on a map. They're owned by people in another country, and they're typically banking in another country. You have no chance of getting anything back. And we've seen this happen over and over again. In fact, one good example of this was um, several years ago, there was a broker called Talonex, which was, I believe, based out of Estonia, but regulated somewhere or, or set up somewhere else. And they were taking US traders. And at some point, the CFTC um, reached out to whatever country was hosting this brokerage and um, basically froze all the bank accounts. So even if you were, say, a European trader trading with this broker, which wouldn't necessarily be per se illegal, um, your funds were frozen because this broker was illegally taking US traders, if you will. Um, so it's always, always, always important to just trade with a regulated broker. The regulation is there for your protection. It doesn't always feel like that. Sometimes the regulation is a bit overreaching, uh, but at the end of the day, it is there specifically to protect the end trader. Uh, and the line that I always use is return of capital is far more important than return on capital. You want to make sure when you get started that your hard on money is coming back to you when you make a withdrawal. That's the first thing to, to that's get a right. Big, that's a big one. Yeah. The second one is, um, it's funny, I've been saying this long before the Trump administration and allegations of fake news and all of that. But, but fake news has been around a long time, smear campaigns, a long time. Um, we have a lot of experience with traders saying, I don't want to work with that broker. I want to work with broker XYZ because I read about them on this forum and they seem to be amazing. Um, <laughs> and um, then they'll say that, you know, the broker you recommended is terrible. And I'll say, well, the broker I recommended has been around for 20 plus years. They're regulated in every major financial jurisdiction in the world. Um, and half the time, those firms are publicly traded. I, I, I said, do you think if they were running the, the criminal enterprises that you just read about online, that they would still be in operation? And rather, you're going with the firm with seven people located in uh, you know, Bulgaria uh, that, that just started six months ago, and they're the, the perfect choice for, for your money. Um, you know, the problem is, is that these forums out there, some of them are good and, and, and Blake and guys, I'm sure you've been quoted in them. You've probably done interviews with them at times, but to a great extent, they're unmoderated yeah. and they're, they're also, they also can be bought to an extent. So what you see is a, a lot of the underhanded tactics that exist, not just in this industry, but, but every industry, um, <clears throat> where you will have people taking advantage of unmoderated forums. They'll take advantage of the anonymity that the internet provides, um, and they will execute various smear campaigns to booster the credibility of their firm while destroying the credibility of their close competitors. And um, it's a very nasty business, uh, but really the key is to look a little bit deeper. Don't follow blindly, think critically. When you're considering a broker, look at where they're based, look at where they're regulated, look at who the principals are, go check out their LinkedIn profiles. Do they have some real pedigree? Do they seem like they know what they're doing or are they hiding behind a veil of uh, form fields and um, you know, faceless, nameless organizations? Uh, those are you things know, that you can do and everyone can do to just be a little bit more certain as to who you're getting into bed with. Uh, Kashif asked a, a question about, um, he goes, you know, once you, once you take a loss, um, when you're trading, does it go to the bank or the broker? Or how's that, how's that work? Because, you know, in some of these situations you wonder, you're like, Oh, oh I just took a loss, but you know, a market is a market, right? But where, where does the, where's the broker making their money here? It, it depends on the broker. It depends on the trader as well. Um, and, and in particular, how those brokers are set up. I've, I've got a slide on that that I'll cover in a bit more okay. detail in a moment, Sounds but, good. um, there, there is a, there is a stigma around uh, market makers and dealing desk brokers out there 
that they're they're always trading against you and you can't win if you work with them. And that's a that's a misnomer. That's a misconception um, because in trading anything, there's always a counterparty to your trade, right? If I right. want to go and buy bananas from my supermarket, the supermarket's selling them to me. And in turn, the supermarket bought the bananas from the distributor and so on. There's always a counterparty to every transaction of every kind, right? So when you want to buy the euro, someone has to sell it to you. It may be the broker. It may be a liquidity provider that's aggregated by the broker. Um, you don't always know that information, but that's not necessarily the driver. It shouldn't be the driver of a decision-making process. It's really a function of is the execution that you're getting from that counterparty quality? Are you getting the price you want at the time that you want it? Those are really the better questions to ask. And, and I'll cover that in a little bit. That sounds good. And I'm going to let you go through. Uh, there, there's a couple questions on, you know, how come there's very few U.S. brokers, but um, we, I'm going to let you get through this presentation. Okay. Um, yep. Yeah. I don't want to take up everyone's morning, so I'll keep going. Okay. Um, so here's that, that slide, actually, that talks a little bit about this. But one of the mistakes that we see is traders just not understanding how brokers ultimately function. So I'll go through some highlights to, to give you some context. And then uh, again, Blake, if there are questions you can ask. Okay. Um, one of the major things that we see is you know, different pricing models. Typically the pricing models fall into two categories. You have a raw spread plus a commission, which is like uh, Pepperstone. Uh, I know you have a relationship with them. So yeah. Pepperstone offers two different pricing models. They have a what they call a razor account, which is a raw spread plus commission. And they have uh, a standard account, which is an all-in spread with no commission. It's important to understand under which circumstances those different pricing models can affect your trading, can affect how you will get into your trade when you might hit a take profit or a stop loss. Um, so it's, it's important to understand those distinctions. Uh, back to the execution question, I'm using uh, some acronyms here, but NDD is a non-dealing desk broker. DD is a dealing desk broker. ECN is electronic communication network. STP is straight through processing. MM is a market maker. These are all different ways in which your broker might be facilitating your trade execution. Um, there are differences and nuances to each of these. Some of them may be helpful to particular strategies. Some may be harmful to particular strategies. The first thing you want to do is just try to understand them, or at least you could ask us or, or you know, someone like yourself, Blake or Dale, um, to explain a little bit of this um, for clarity. Um, but different execution styles will work better for different strategies. And that's something to keep in mind as well. The last key issue on this is, uh, is really understanding regulation, understanding leverage and how margin works. So you don't end up in a situation where you can't take any more trades because you're at a margin. Understanding how certain rules such as FIFO or hedging might impact your, your margin, might impact your ability to get in and out the way that you want. Uh, again, these are all important considerations to understand about a broker you're considering and how it might affect your strategy. And um, I'm a big believer that, uh, that life is long, especially if you make poor decisions. Um, so, you know, in this case, just take the time to, to learn, to do a little bit of research or talk to people who have before you rush in and just choose a broker uh, to make sure that you're taking into account the right pricing models, execution and regulation to suit your trading needs. Um, the next one here is using the wrong platform. So I, I love those interactions with traders who say that, uh, well, I can only trade with this platform because my friends, neighbors, sisters, dog walkers, uh, grandmother specifically trades with XYZ platform and everyone else, every other one is terrible. <laughs> and it just makes me laugh because basically all the trading platforms in the world are about 98% the same. They're representations of data. They all typically have the same um, indicator functionality. Um, and they all basically allow you to buy and sell and set stop losses and take profits and do basic charting functionality and so on. Um, what we stress is that you want to put um, substance over form in the fact that when you're using a trading platform, just like you know, driving a car or using a personal computer, you just want to be fluent in it. You want to know how it works. You want to be able to navigate the screen quickly to find the chart, to find the button, to run the technical indicator that you, you want to use and see in your chart. Because if you 
don't have that fluency and if you're not comfortable with your platform, you're going to make mistakes, right? And in, in my household, I'm a PC guy. My wife is a Mac girl. I can't figure out how to get onto an internet browser using her computer. Uh, uh, it just uh, doesn't same. resonate with me. Yeah. Um, and so I use a PC because the way my mind is wired and the way that I, I logically think through a progression works because of how their operating system works. The same concept really applies to a trading platform. Don't necessarily go with what someone tells you you should be using. Try them all out. They're all free. They're all available. Figure out what resonates the most with the way that your mind works, with how you're comfortable trading, and just stick with that. Um, there's very few instances where you can only use one platform. And typically, that's if you're using some sort of algorithmic code that's been specifically developed for just that platform. But outside of that, really, any platform can work. It's just about finding the right one for you. The, the next mistake, uh, and we're getting towards the end here, uh, Blake, so I'll be able to take questions soon, is okay. pairing a good strategy with a bad broker. This is sort of a, a putting it all together mistake um, where you can have a strategy that works really, really well. It could be a swing strategy in large size. It could be a short-term strategy that scalps around the market. But if you don't fully understand the environment in which your type of trading strategy will thrive, you may end up trying to fit a round peg in a square hole. You don't want to do that. You want to basically say, you know, if I'm, if I'm uh, trying to uh, build a, you know, a, a nursery garden in my backyard, I need to know what kind of water it needs, how much water, how much sunlight, you know, when is a good time to put it out or not. You know, there's, there's different things that go into making something thrive and grow as well as possible. And you really need to know what it is that you're doing, what your strategy needs to succeed, and then take into all those other factors that we've talked about to try to create the most optimal environment for that strategy as possible. Um, and again, that's tougher for newer traders because there are a lot of factors and they may not have experience with all that, but ultimately that's where, um, you know, we say you don't have to figure it out alone. Um, you know, as we talked, there's no, you know, there's not the same formal training that a lot of, uh, you know, prop traders had, you know, or bank traders had coming out these days. A lot of people have to figure it out alone and it's very, very difficult. There's a lot of noise out there. Um, and really the brokers are not helpful because the brokers have biases, right? If I call up Oanda and we love Oanda, we do a lot of business with them as a broker. Uh, but if I'm a prospective client and I ask, you know, well, why should I trade with you as opposed to this broker? They've got this, you know, the person on the other end of that phone is not going to talk up how great your competitor is. They're just going to point out all the flaws and try to get you to open an account with them. They're not giving you objective agnostic advice. Um, they're trying to win your business. So it's very hard to find objective resources. And again, that goes back to our original mission or tenant, which was to be broker agnostic, to help traders find the right fit for them, not the right fit for us. And that's why we work with multiple brokers, because we don't want to put a round peg in a square hole. We don't want to force a situation. We want to understand your needs, look at our menu of broker options, account types, and so on, and help you find the right uh, broker fit for what you're looking to do. Um, and so you don't have to go it alone if you don't want to. You can leverage our experience and our relationships and, and you know, accelerate your learning curve, if you will, uh, and avoid hopefully some costly mistakes. And that's, you know, aside from the fact that we'll provide that ongoing service and support um, along with the rebates. And so, you know, just a quick recap here. Um, you know, the first thing we try to do with all of our clients is understand their needs and help them get paired with the right broker for what they're looking to do. Um, we don't disappear here after that. Um, you know, we continue to be available for any questions or issues that arise, whether it's with that broker, that platform, or otherwise. Um, we're, we're, we're pretty savvy and, and knowledgeable when it comes to all things trading these days. Um, and we can be a great resource to traders who want to take advantage of that. And then lastly, again, um, helping traders save money. Uh, on every trade that they place. I mean, this is a for-profit industry. So if we can help you to save some money, uh, then let us do that. Um, and here's just a, an infographic which explains um, how the rebate program works. Uh, it's available on our website at forestparkfx.com. But in short, there are, no, there are no gimmicks. There are no hidden fees. There are no hidden costs. This is literally pure savings for you with virtually any broker that you're working with, as long as we have a relationship with them. Um, but instead of just going to the broker to open the account directly, you would first come through our website, 
and you would then open the account. We'll take you to the same application page, but you'll be tagged as coming through our introducing relationship. As a result of that, you'll have the same pricing, the same execution. We don't have any ability to interfere with your trades, um, but because we're the introducer, we, are, we do have the ability to service your account and help you with any issues that arise. And then the brokers compensate us for introducing your account in uh, a form of either a portion of the spread or the commission that you pay. And again, there's no markups on that. So that you're still paying the exact same cost of trading as if you had a direct relationship. But part of our value add is out of the compensation we receive from the broker, we share that with you. Um, and so this is basically what this infographic is, uh, is explaining. And again, um, no hidden fees, no catches. Um, it's literally pure value for you. Uh, in the U.S., and, and Blake, I know there's a question about why there's so few. Uh, currently, there are three regulated FX brokers in the U.S. We work with all of them, uh, OANDA, Forex.com, and IG. Um, and then outside the U.S., um, there's a, there are really hundreds of brokers out there. Uh, we've been very, very selective over the years in who we work with, trying to really work with the best of the best, ones that um, – have a history of being good actors that uh, are heavily regulated, reputable, well-capitalized, well-run. Uh, in pretty much all of these cases, I believe I've been to their headquarters and met the principals of the companies. So we've done a lot of due diligence to uh, basically assure ourselves and protect our clients that these are good firms to work with. Uh, and, okay. and, 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 I, and I wanted to, to mention, you know, what, in regards to the U.S., why there's so little, um, there's so very few options for those of us that live in the United States. And in, in a lot of cases, Canada is because of the, the, the fees that, um, that the regulators here in the United States require the brokers to put up. Right. Yeah, it's um, it's extraordinarily expensive to be a regulated broker in the U.S. and Canada. Uh, in the U.S. in particular, you have to have a net capital requirement of twenty million dollars. That's literally just twenty million dollars that you've got to basically park in an account that you can't even use for your operations. And so, so and and I want to mention that because when um, you know one of the one of the reasons why I just so you guys, I have to give you guys a little bit of backstory here. When I was with MB Trading and I was, you know, the chief currency strategist there, and then they were being acquired by Trade King, then Trade King to Ally Financial, I knew where this was going. Ally Financial was buying basically the brokerage business to, you know, acquire the clients from a, from a, um, uh, you know, from a, a um, they, they wanted to acquire just the client base. But they were going to ditch the FCM because they didn't want to put up twenty million dollars. I knew where this was going. I'm and and I and I told the principal at at MB Trading. I'm like, look, I, I need to I need to make sure I've got something lined up for myself. I've I've got this idea of Forex Analytics, blah blah blah. And uh, I started Forex Analytics at that time before I even started trading for the for the firm out of Florida um, because they hadn't even approached me at that point. But I knew it was coming because who wants to put up? And at that time, I think it was even more than 20 million. It was 20 or 25, maybe it was 20 at the time. $20 million to, to just put up as an FCM to keep it in escrow and not use it as Justin pointed out, not use it as, as operating anything. It just has to sit in escrow. No one wants to do that. And I knew they were just going to ditch the, uh, the, 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 the brokerage license um, as soon as they made the acquisition and that they did and they dissolved it. So uh, you know, that's a lot of money, Justin. <laughs> it's a lot. And it only goes up as your assets on deposit grow too. So that's just the yeah. bare minimum. Um, Maybe that was for, it. It was, it was going to be a lot more too on top yeah, of that. It, it so high. like firms like Oanda and, and Forex.com, which are the leaders uh, stateside, I mean, I think they're up to like $60 million that they are required to just park yeah. in an account. They, they can't do it. So they can't use it for anything, really. Um, yeah. You don't have quite the same steep requirements outside the US, which is why you have many more brokers, which is why it's also that much more important to look deeper into who really is well capitalized and well run. Exactly. Uh, and so uh, these are the brokers we work with. Um, they're, they're all terrific. Uh, they all have different value propositions in different ways. Um, if, if people who are participating here have accounts with these brokers um, already, but are not part of our rebate program, we can typically uh, work with them to accomplish that um, and, and get them to start saving money from this point forward, which is good. And uh, that's all I got. Um, 
that's my contact info and oh sorry justin (laughs) sorry no 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 sorry so that's justin and and uh justin you anything else you want to say because i know dale's got a he got a couple questions queued up here no i i'm uh, i'm happy to take any questions and uh i appreciate the opportunity to be here today Awesome. We're, we're happy to have you here. Dale, did yeah. you want to go ahead and take it? Well, you know, some people are saying, Justin, that even regulated uh, brokers, uh, you know, have violations. Um, but even though they have violations, uh, um, they're sanctioned for those violations, have to correct those violations. And, um, you know, is there any guarantee, even though you're with a regulated broker, that, um, that if they went upside down, that you'd get your money back? So it depends on the jurisdiction where you're operating. The reason, one of the reasons that the- Yep. So the US does not have um, any sort of insurance or compensation scheme in the event that a broker were to become insolvent, um, which is why the, um, the net capital requirements are so high. Basically it's there to guard against that since there is no uh, type of insurance fund. Um, additionally, it's very unlikely, even, the, even in the scenario where a broker might become undercapitalized, that, um, that a client would, would end up receiving pennies on the dollar um, for the capital that they have because the going concern value of these brokers is tremendous. So as we saw with FXCM back in 2015, with the SMB uh, depegging of the franc to the euro, um, they lost around 300 something million dollars in about a minute um, as a firm. And it forced them to be wow. undercapitalized per NFA requirements. Um, and yet within 24 hours, they were able to secure a loan north of $300 million because the, the going value concern of that business was so great that someone was more than happy to that had the capital to put up that money and make the brokerage whole again, because they would make back that money and then some over time. Um, and the same is really true for the brokers that you have now in the U.S. I mean, Forex.com is was just acquired by uh, FC Stone, which is a gigantic uh, financial institution that's publicly traded. Um, IG is publicly traded on the London Stock Exchange and extremely well capitalized. And Oanda is a privately held company that was just acquired a couple of years ago uh, by a very large uh, uh, private equity firm out of Asia. Um, and again, all of these firms are uh, operating in every major financial jurisdiction in the world. Um, so they are, you know, goes beyond just the, the U.S. capitalization amounts. They are very, very well shored up um, as organizations that the likelihood of that is really remote. So is uh, this capitalization amount a fraction of customer deposits or equal to? It's a fraction of. Okay. So if there is a problem, there's still uh, of insolvency because of, uh, you know, uh, de-pegging of the Swiss. It still is possible for people not to get their money back. Like in the old days, uh, Justin, I'm sure you remember things like Stotler. Um, being a member of a exchange, um, exchange members came to uh, make people whole um, to, uh, you know, maintain the integrity of the CME, CBOT, mm-hmm. right? So there's always risk of not getting your deposit back, even though they have this type of uh, deposit on hold, Correct. Um, it's, it's a, it's a theoretical possibility in reality. Um, it is not likely to, um, to recur. It's never happened. Uh, in FX, I don't believe it has happened. No. Okay. No. Okay. And, uh, I have a tagline for, for you, um, that if your broker cannot see the forest from the trees, Call Justin at Forest Park, and it'll be a picnic. I like that. Who said that? Me. <laughs> That's Dale. Make it. Oh, Dale. There's put a tagline for you. I, I, I was, I, I was moved by the words. I, I, I can't believe well, it. Well, you need um, a hanky. 
I, I'm a little emotional right now. <laughs> you, can, uh, you can do our PR, Dale. That was All right, terrific. Buddy. Okay. Uh, I appreciate that. So it was um, great, having you, great having you come in. You want to wrap it with anything that, um, you know, really, you know, uh, uh, kind of sets you apart from a lot of other people that may also have relationships with other IBs. Uh, I, I, you know, I think that the major thing is that, you know, trust is something that only happens with the passing of time and performance during that time. And uh, that's why we all love you here at Forex <laughs> Analytics. I, I appreciate that. Um, no, I, I'll just say, you know, look, we are, we are aligned with our clients. It's, it's one of our core values. We did not want to be pitted against our clients and trying to make money at their expense. Uh, so we're positioned to be the trader's ally and advocate. And uh, what we want to do is set everyone up for success, be there to support them as needed, and, and hopefully uh, help each trader grow their own trading business. Um, and in turn, our business will grow as a function of that. I mean, we are not a marketing firm. Um, I haven't sent out an email blast in uh, probably four years. Uh, you know, we just grow through, you know, the old fashioned word of mouth. Um, if we do a good relationships. job. Relationships. Yeah. People will, will share that and uh, and hopefully yeah. our business will grow as a function of it. And that's and that's been the case with you guys. I've watched over the last several years. It's it's been it's been pretty, pretty, pretty fun to watch, actually, from our point of view. Hey, uh, um, Justin, I, I, first, first and foremost, I want to thank you for being here today. I think this is a really important um, interview for people to hear because they, they need to hear, you know, who, who's on their side, especially when you're dealing with a broker. Because sometimes when, you know, as a trader, you feel like you're alone, you know, you feel like you're alone in this battle. And uh, to know that they've got somebody like your company standing side to side with them, really fighting on their behalf is it's, it's, it's reassuring. Um, but there was a, there was a question though, that came in from Paul regarding FXCM and, and said, aren't they, aren't they banned from the U S uh, he, he obviously sees that you have FXCM as w one of your brokers that you do recommend. Um, why is that? Because they are banned in the United States. Uh, it's, it's a good question. Um, I am very, very familiar with, uh, with what happened um, here in the U.S., what what transpired ultimately was a couple of key things. Uh, one was it was sort of the the last straw um, between uh, FXCM and the the NFA. Um, it was a bit of an animus relationship that had uh, grown worse over time, um, where you had um, a, a pioneer in the industry in Drew Niv as CEO of FXCM really always pushing the envelope of what you could do under the regulations here. Um, but in particular, the issue with what led to the, the ultimate banning of FXCM in the US had nothing to do with their handling of uh, traders and trade execution. Um, the, the underlying issue that gave rise to that suit um, was something that actually greatly benefited the trader at the end of the day. Um, the traders got better trade execution than they would under other constructs as a function of the way that FXCM was operating. The issue uh, stemmed more from the way that information was disclosed uh, to various parties, primarily investors. Um, and uh, the, the pricing execution and trader experience with FXCM um, at all times was really among the best in the world, still is. Um, so it was really, it was just an unfortunate situation where it was sort of the, the straw that broke the camel's back here in the U.S., where I, I believe the regulators saw it as an opportunity to get rid of FXCM, which had been a thorn in its side. Um, and, I, and I have to mention just from, uh, because I was with MB Trading and I know the, the principles at MB Trading, I was very much friends with. And um, I mean, I watch FXCM really push the envelope as you using your words, but they really uh, suffocated every FCM that was in the United States by always putting pressure on the regulators to up the amount of money that had to be 
put up at, uh, at, you know, in escrow because they knew that they had the most capital. So they would, they, they, they kept, kept going back to the regulators saying, Hey, you need to, you need to raise the minimum, minimum requirement to 10 million. And then it was to 15 million. I watched them do it. And, and I had these conversations with the principals at MV trading and they're just like, dude, this is crazy. They're, they're really squeezing out all the brokers in the U S and that's what they did. Listen to yeah. this, Blake and uh, Justin, a great uh, testimonial by one of our attendees, viewers. I like the honesty of Forest Park. This is from Giark. They couldn't find a better broker for me and were upfront about it. So there you go. How many people would say uh, you're okay? You know, you don't have to do it. You're, we can't find anything better for you than you already have. <laughs> so, yeah. uh, you know, how many people will say that? Yeah, well, we're we're not yeah. in the hard sell business and, and yeah. don't want to be. So. so, I mean, that's a great testimonial as far as I'm concerned. That's really about integrity. So um, that's what this business, uh, that's what you guys are all about. You live it, you breathe it, and then people that have dealt with you um, talk about it. Yeah, well, I, I, same same with with you guys, and which is why it's been you know such a pleasure to work with uh, with the Forex Analytics team over the years. Is you know the the, the good guys should stick together, and and hopefully can uh, can make that apparent to those who are trying to figure out who the good guys and the bad guys are. Yeah, all, yeah. We, got, all we have to yeah. do is wear white hats, buddy. <laughs> right? If it were that simple. <laughs> yeah, and and I, I have to mention that the, there's always I mean brokers no one's going to have uh, a perfect record there. There's always going to be people that have issues yeah. and, and those types of things. And, you know, especially if you've been around this business long enough, you've seen it. And look, I, I think one thing that everybody's got to be aware of is forest park gives you a lot of different options and they're going to help, you know, they're going to help guide you like, Hey, you know, this has been our experiences over here. And these have been our experiences over here. And that, they, and I always tell people, we're as traders, we're different. I mean, the break broker that's going to be right for me, swing trading the market might be different for somebody else that's out there scalping the market needs a needs a little bit tighter spread, maybe even doesn't mind paying a commission because they're in and out like, you know, 40 times a day where I might sit in a trade all week long and be only in five trades throughout the week. So we're going to need different types of services from different brokers. And I couldn't imagine there's anybody else that does that job better than you guys. So I appreciate it. And yeah. I appreciate the time and, uh, and everyone's attention today and heading into a, a holiday weekend, wish everyone, uh, um, you know, a nice long weekend for those that are, are able to enjoy it. Uh, and again, if I can help anyone that, uh, that participated, you've got my contact information on screen and, uh, would love to uh, love to work with you, love to help you save some money. And, uh, even if we can't, as you, you mentioned, Dale, you know, we'll, we'll be upfront and honest about it. Okay, great. All right, everyone. So uh, wrapping up the week with someone uh, that can help you. Uh, there's no cost in reaching out. If you have any seeds of doubt that you could do better and you're not getting rebates, whatever the issue is, uh, reach out to Justin or Trent and you won't get, uh, you won't be hanging on to a phone prompt uh, saying, you know, press one, press two. <laughs> These guys are there for you. So, um, you know, even to educate yourself about who you're with, if you want their opinion of it, give them a call. And uh, Blake, great week. Uh, we laid it all out on the court for you guys again this week. You know, it's our mission to build up and edify traders every day. Um, I'm looking forward to a three-day weekend. Uh, I went crazy on my birthday and had a beer last night, so I'm recovering. And uh, we'll see everyone Monday. Uh, wait, Tuesday, wait, wait a second, right? Dale. Wait, wait a oh, second. Okay. First yeah. of all, thank you, Justin. And uh, oh. but second of all, you you know you know in um in 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 Europe they're not celebrating our Memorial Day. We're oh. working on Monday, buddy. Sorry, just oh. kidding. Nah, you guys yeah, have yeah. a great long weekend. <laughs> <laughs> he was like, no. All right, oh, and guys, then Justin. I and then is then I have you know in September uh, you know I have uh, Rosh Hashanah and oh Yom Kippur I know oh boy uh, and anyway <laughs> you know I I like Blake I think I'm says, Jewish too I, yeah you are Blake I, yeah, I'm, I'm yeah, looking yeah. forward to in your September, <laughs> <Yeah>. in September. <laughs> <laughs> all right everyone.
Thank so you. So remember, don't Thanks, just Justin. count your pips, count your blessings and, uh, you know, be grateful for something uh, very hard to be uh, depressed and grateful simultaneously. Try it. It won't work. So uh, I'll see you guys. Right. Thanks. Be well, weekend. everyone. Thank you.